Hey everyone, Ari Labs here with the Spending Time Podcast. I am joined by a very special guest, Mr. Peter Speakmarin. Hey Peter. Hi Ariel. Okay, so I have to explain who Peter is, because Peter is someone who is a very important person, in my opinion, in today's watch industry. I remember the first time that I really got to know you was a story about you. You want to know who told me? Go ahead, tell me. It was it was someone I just mentioned literally a few minutes ago, it was Max Booster. And Max brought you up in a conversation one time years ago and he just couldn't say enough good things about you how you helped him in a time of need how you were unselfish how you were a uh, a true colleague how you helped help them navigate through the complexities of making things in switzerland and he seemed to walk away from all that seeing you as a friend forever um you know I, and i'm thinking to myself boy i want people talking about me the way max talked about you you know what i mean that's um that's lovely to hear and it's very very sweet um it probably stems from the first project that max did on his own after having left harry winston when he first developed mbnf and i was one of the technical guys partly project management on the very first horological machine that he made and he had left this incredible position at Harry Winston after having turned around the company, um, having developed this incredible reputation through the creativity of developing the whole Opus line. And he then took all of the money that he had actually generated, all of everything that he had saved to explore his own personal life project, which was the development of MBNF. And the very first project hit a, a major issue halfway through because one of the principal or the principal supplier changed ownership and the new owner was changed their he mind. Changed, he changed <laughs> their mind on how to operate it. So Max was left with components but no watchmakers. And I orchestrated a, a team of, uh, of watchmakers around it to be able to realize that product. I, I basically, I've helped a lot of people uh, without any expectation of return, because that's not why I do things. Um, but when that happened, I reached out to all those people who were my friends and put this team together. And then we were able to realize the product, realize the first horological machine, which then enabled Max to be able to continue with his project which since has become just the most incredible brand, uh, producing the most incredible watches. So he's been very generous, very kind, and he always recites this story when he speaks to people. And it's one of the reasons why he as an individual, I have respect for, because he's bright, intelligent, he's, he has like all of us uh, an ego, but he does not forget those people that help him on the road. Um, so I've had a lot of people who have actually said similar things to me as you have just done. So as much as I enjoyed um, being able to help him, it's extremely flattering when it actually comes back. It's a little bit of karma. It is, and at the same time, you know, you, you have people that like you before they even really get to know you. And then I got to know you and I realized you're an interesting guy. I mean, look, in, I started out in the watch industry when I was 25. And I'm, I just turned 36 and you are, you, I think you've been there the entire time. And I remember you yeah. told me that you began as a, I mean, obviously you went, you know, studied to become a watchmaker, but you were a restorer, right? Okay. I won't give you the full story because I'll probably put your audience into a coma. Um, but I started off when I was 17 years old because I had no direction after leaving school slightly prematurely. Um, I studied in Hackney College in London before going to Switzerland, where I studied in Neuchâtel, um, then did uh, a number of, then executed a few jobs in after sales service in Oxford, in London, in Southampton, working for companies like Omega, Piaget, Rolex. Uh, and then I spent seven incredible years in Piccadilly in the restoration of antique wrist and pocket watches. And that period of my life was really what influenced the brand which I then developed later and also it's where I fell in love with watchmaking um, it is 
Imagine so the, years, the years spent watchmaking before that didn't do it. it you had to. It was. <laughs> you hated watching. Yeah. The, what it was was the reason. One of the reasons I was enamored with this idea of get, getting into horology was not horology. I always wanted to travel. I always had this desire to leave home to be able to get out of the UK to be able to get around the world. Uh, but not necessarily with a rucksack on my back, but living in different places for different periods of time. And when you become a, a watchmaker, oh, this is one of the sales points from my careers feature, is that when you become a, a watchmaker, this means that you can work anywhere in the world because there are retailers, there are workshops all over the world, and there was always, there's always been. And I started in 1985, 87, 85 was when I actually began. Um, there was always, even at that stage, a need for watch technicians, I would say. Not really watchmakers, but watch technicians. Right. So the, the drive at the beginning, apart from the fact that I immediately got into it and I was immediately kind of, I found it easy. I was good at it. It just, it fitted my skill set. So I didn't actually have to work too hard to, to be one of the best in the class. But the thing that drove me was not the love of what I was doing, but where it could actually lead me. And that was very much in the direction of, of travel. And then a couple of years go by and I do all these different jobs. Each one I held down for about six months because I learned very quickly, I worked very fast. And the moment that I'd actually mastered that particular product or job, I then moved on to something else because I got bored. When I went into Somlo Antiques in the Piccadilly Arcade uh, in about 1990, I think it was, um, it was the most incredible learning curve working with brands that are the most famous that exist today as well as brands that have been forgotten in history and working with everything from simple timepiece which date from the beginning of the life of Rolex all the way through to the most complex grand sonneries and minute repeaters and tourbillons that go back to the 19th century. So, so where did you go to watchmaking school? Okay, so I started off in London at Hackney Technical College, and then after that, it was in Neuchatel at Wostep, and that school, Wostep was watches, Watchmakers of Switzerland Training and Education Program. Uh, and that's and a prestigious was, place. Pardon, that's, say again? That, that's a prestigious place. It's become very prestigious. I mean, it's been around now for, I don't know, 30 years. Uh, some a lot of foreign watchmakers have gone through it because it's not really directed towards Swiss watchmakers. Swiss watchmakers go to Swiss watchmaking schools. Wostep was originally designed, I believe, for actually educating American watchmakers back in the late 60s or early 70s, something like that. Um, and then it was opened up because of lack of students to a much wider group of people from different countries around the world. And the only criteria was that you already had to be a watchmaker. You had to have something like a minimum of five years uh, experience at the bench. And then you would go there. And the, the basic course that I did was called the refresher course. So you went there for four to five months. I think it was four months at the time to be able to actually refine what you already knew. But you already had to be a watchmaker. But there's been a plethora of different watchmakers that, that you know have gone through Wostep. Probably oh, yeah. the most famous one. Carrie Vodelainen, who ended up actually teaching there. Stephen McDonnell, who learnt as well as ended up becoming a teacher there. Um, Stephen Falsey, Tim and Bart Gronefeld. Um, these few names are names that I mentioned because they're names that uh, your listeners may have actually heard of. But all of these sure. guys have actually traversed Wostep. And most of us were taught by a guy called Antoine Simonet, who's now, I think he's about 80 years old, something like that. He's so pretty My, my understanding is that Wostep, uh, unlike some of these other technician schools, actually teaches you how to make watches, whereas a lot of these other places, especially outside of Switzerland, are mostly teaching how to service existing things, fix things, to not really be a, a watchmaker, as the name implies. It has changed since I was there, but in essence, you could learn as quickly and as much as you were prepared to learn, meaning that the faster that you were, the more that you would actually absorb. The basic school lessons, the basic um, structure was around repair and very basic restoration. So 
you would learn how to deal with jewels, closing up barrels, um, the theory behind how escapements work, how watches work. But if you went fast enough and you learned sufficiently, then you could actually enter restoration. And when you enter restoration, you are becoming, I would say, a real watchmaker. The refresher course was the first one, which was very generic, very general. And then you went on to the course on complications, which really involved dismantling, understanding how the things actually worked, and then making and replacing components which were either worn or missing from them. So that was real watchmaking. Um, and back when I was there, the amount of tools were very minimal. So you had to be very creative in actually how you would make stuff. Today, the workshops are well advanced and they have, they're, they're much better funded, they're much better organized, and you have the potential to learn everything that you want to. Having said that, the, the, the courses are, are changing. So I do not know what the existing uh, courses are that are actually being offered at WordStep. But it's, it, it influenced me and it's influenced a great deal of other watchmakers, foreign watchmakers, uh, during our professional careers. So what, at what point in your career did you decide that being a watchmaker, being a restorer wasn't enough, you needed to put your name on the dial? That was not, in a sense, a dream or even an intention. Um, when I first started watchmaking, the, you probably had the beginning of the really well-known independent watchmakers. And the first one who became very, uh, very visible was, was Frank Muller. Following Frank Muller, you had Roger Dubuis. In parallel, you had people like Richard Mill as an entrepreneur creating his own brand. But when I started, um, I never aspired or wanted, in a sense, to have my own name on a watch. The very first watch I ever made was a pocket watch called the Foundation Watch. And on that watch, you had on the right-hand side of the dial the name The Watch Workshop, and on the left-hand side, you had Speak Marin. The reason I put my name on the watch was for equilibrium because of graphic, uh, graphic design. It was never intended to become uh, a brand name. But, and again, just very quickly to go through that story, I finished the watch, I took it to Basel, I actually went to the AHCI, I showed it to, um, I showed it to Philip Dufour, who said that I should exhibit with the Academy the following year. So to when you exhibit with the Academy, you, it costs money. So you don't do it for ego or for pleasure, although there are possibly people that do that. You do it because you have something to sell upon which you actually build a life. So during the year, and it was like 2001 to 2002, I developed prototypes taking the design of the pocket watch, all of the different elements from the DNA, to make a, a wristwatch which I wanted, which didn't exist, which was coherent with the design of that pocket watch. On the right hand side of the pocket watch was the name The Watch Workshop. That was my company's name, and that is what I wanted the brand to be called. But the moment that I started to make my first watches, the collectors who started to order them said they didn't want the watch workshop, they wanted my name. And as a, a friend of mine who designed my first website put it, the watch workshop is about as romantic as Jack's shed. And he had a, he had a, he had a point. So I kind of succumbed to the practicalities of the people who were actually purchasing the watches and I called it Speak Marin, my family name. So well, I guess I guess I, ha I asked the wrong question because I should have asked you what made you want to sell versus be, you know, what made you want to be exposed? And I guess I had another question. Where did you learn about design? Because I don't know that they teach you that in watchmaking school. No, no, no. Um, so the, the, the design question. Um, the reason that I made the pocket watch, and I started making the pocket watch when I, about two years into living in Switzerland, when I was working for Renault and Papi, Audemars Piguet, building complications. And very much every watchmaker who is a watchmaker because they want to be or they're passionate about it, because in Switzerland there are watchmakers who are simply, it's just a job, like in every right. 
in every career. People do things to earn money and then their passions are, are elsewhere. But most watchmakers who are passionate about what they do, somewhere inside of them is the desire to, to, make, uh, to make a watch. And I was living in a, a small uh, farm, uh, uh, farm building, um, which was massive. And there was one bedroom which actually had a tiled floor. And I ended up converting that, that bedroom into a workshop. And I, I had all the tools, I had all the equipment because it was all very inexpensive to purchase at that period. And I, I built my watch. And building my pocket watch for me was a, a rites of passage to prove to myself that I wasn't only a watchmaker who could make a watch, but I was a constructor who could design the technical elements of a watch, as well as a designer who could make something which was aesthetically original and pleasing. At least it was pleasing to me. I didn't expect it to be pleasing to other people because I wasn't trying to please other people. I was doing something which was a, a representation of who I am and who I was as a watchmaker. And within that was born the foundation watch. And then ensuing that was the brand. Um, what, sorry, and what, what was the, the question which uh, was before that? I think you answered it all. <laughs> I, yeah. I have, I, here, look, you know, I, you're part of a very special club now. I know this isn't your favorite topic, but you're part of a club of men who have a brand that has their name on it that they, they're no longer associated with from a business perspective. Roger Dubuis was, you know, a man, he's a man like that, you know, was a man like that. Uh, Daniel Roth, uh, George Heisek. And in others, and now you. Um, what's it? What's it feel like to be, you know, in this club? It's an emotion that I don't think most people have or or, or understand that the name, their name, is on something that they no longer associate with. You know what I mean? No, I I I get it. Um, it's it's a good question, and it's something that I've thought about quite a lot because even though I'm I was never driven to develop a product and a brand that had my name on it. Everything that I did was very much an extension of who I am. And I put a lot of, as it were, heart and soul into that. And I, I think I gave it everything that anybody would give. When you develop a business and when it's your business, you probably give more to that business than you would ever give to anything or anybody, anybody else. And then you end up with what is called founder's disease whereby you end up doing everything because you can do everybody's job on, on every level because during the evolution of that business, you're forced to. And I mean everything from the accounting to the marketing to the logistics to the commercial side. So you become, you become in a sense, a jack of all trades, which is not necessarily a good thing. Hey, you're, you're, you're talking to one. I, I'm, I'm very familiar with this disease. Sure. Listen, I mean, it, it's 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 not a it's not a unique uh, it's not a unique thing. Uh, it, it's the reality, and it gives an incredible experience. It makes you very rounded in one sense, but also it means that you are, or for me at least, it meant that it made it very difficult for me to detach and stop, because it was entirely consuming. I'm a I am a combination of somebody who's partially left and right brained. I'm both pragmatic as well as creative. I'm both a uh, sort of, I've become fairly entrepreneurial while still being very emotional about what I actually do. Um, and I couldn't stop with what I was doing. I couldn't stop. So I got to a point with that business where for various different reasons, which really are not relevant or important. My health was being impacted by the amount of stress that I was managing. And I made the decision, and probably more for my family and also for my own sense of well-being, that I had to leave. And I'm actually very grateful that this whole thing happened. Because if I had not have actually left, I would not have developed the Naked Watchmaker. I would not have developed the Stoic, uh, Stoic World and Stoic Timepieces. And everything I did was one part of my life. And 
I would have I would have probably had uh, things panned out differently for different political reasons. I would have seen it to the grave. But having been forced to make a very hard decision to actually leave that company, to leave what I had actually built over a 17-year period, has opened up an entirely new world to me, uh, a world of uh, internet design, a world of education, a world of sharing uh, 30 years of life with a growing number of people out there who want to be, not I would say want to be educated, but simply want to know more. And I love what I do, and I love being able to share what I do. So this being becoming part of that group for some people, I think, has been a defining element. I mean, for all of us, it becomes a defining element in our life. But the way I see it is that for me, it meant one door opened when one door closed. And when that new door opened, I have actually, I've grown. I've grown as a person. I've met incredible individuals. I begin to have a much more rounded view to the business of what, the industry of watchmaking. Because before I was very much uniquely this independent watchmaker. Now I still work with independent watchmakers, but I've also had an insight into the big companies. Um, and I've seen things which I hadn't expected. And I've met people who I have incredible reverence for. None of that would have happened had I stayed in my, my previous existence. So here's something interesting. That club of people that I mentioned, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure everyone stayed in the watch industry. Like even kind of, <clears throat> you know, you acknowledge that when you leave that brand, you're no longer able to put your name on another product, right? Because part of leaving the brand with your name on it is that you no longer have the right to put your name, at least in a lot of ways, on products. Yet there's this tendency to stay in the same industry. Like despite how we complained about the watch industry, there's a, I don't know, there's a comfort or a, a fascination that, that, that keeps us still within it. Um, you know, it, is it interesting for you that none of these guys went and, and took their talents and did something else? Um, I don't know what the ages of all the different people are, and there are, I mean, you could probably add uh, Richard Braun to the list, uh, not Richard Braun. Oh, uh, Martin, Martin. Martin Braun, excuse me. You can probably add Martin, and there, and there, are, the, there are others. Part of it is probably down to age. You spend, you know, the majority of your professional life in one career, and then to be able to actually switch career to something else, is probably very difficult when you when you hit whatever 40 50 or your mid 50s to be able to change all of your expertise sure. everything that you actually know professionally remains in one domain the other thing is that is and it's one of the core points about watchmaking there is a passion behind it there is a love behind it you cannot sit at a bench for eight to 12 hours a day, depending on whether you're self-employed or employed, um, and do something that you hate to do, not with the kind of ex eccentricity or the kind of precision, uh, the patience that it actually requires. And you only really require patience when you do something that you don't enjoy, to my way of seeing things. So watchmaking is very much, and this is not trying to sell anything, Watchmaking is that there's, there's a love behind it. There's a passion behind it. The moment for myself when I feel at my most at ease or at peace, um, the most, I would say, almost in control of, of my life is actually when I'm at a bench. When I have this like two square meters of space in front of me, my tools in a domain that, that I know with product either that I've designed or other people's product that they've designed. But I know it, I know it intrinsically because I've spent so many of my years um, profoundly involved in it and I love it. Um, and I've tried to understand why. Um, and there's this combination of, of mechanics, of art, of history, of design, of material, of technology, all of these things combined but ultimately, what it comes down to is everything that I touch was conceived in somebody's imagination and then made real. And I love that. I love that reality. 
it's, like a, it's a fascinating micro reality where you're in control, right? Like in the rest of the world, it's too chaotic. No one's really in control, but in this in this world, you are. In when when I sit at my bench, I know, I kind of know everything, and I've had I have so much experience within my domain. There's very little that confuses me or stumps me. Uh, if I have, I mean, I, I'm not really involved uh, in restoration anymore. Uh, my life is very much around sharing of, of knowledge. Um, but when things are placed in front of me, I know how they work. Um, and I'm fascinated by it. I don't always understand how things are executed. And that is actually interesting because what I've become almost more fascinated by are not ideas, but how ideas are actually made real. Because an idea on its own is worth nothing. But if you can feed it, you can nourish it, you can actually make it grow. It's the execution which I find really quite enthralling. That is the knowledge. And when you go to different companies and you see how different people execute things, there is, it's, it's within that dynamic that I begin to become, and I have been for a long time, I have a, I have a genuine interest. Uh, something that goes beyond the um, beyond the idea into the realization of the final concept. So you live in Switzerland and you've lived there on and off for a while. Um, you're not Swiss, but you've had to deal with Swiss culture. Tell us two things that the rest of the world could learn from Swiss culture and two things that Swiss culture could definitely learn from the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for giving me a heads up on this one beforehand, Ariel. Um, two things that we can learn from the Swiss. Um, goodness. Okay, if I one thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, no, it's like when you. It's like I, I'm, I'm able. I'm able to talk for hours about pretty much anything. Um, it's, it's more refining it to things which are really relevant. Right, okay. Right. <laughs> so, okay. So, so what? One of the things. Okay. One of the things that I mean, it's all. It's what what the world can learn about watchmaking, is that. And I, I was on another podcast recently by a friend of mine who lives in Denver, and I think he posed this question or something similar to it. And one of the things when it comes to watchmaking. We're talking about Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was on the show too, actually. Yeah. No, that's right. He mentioned it to me. He mentioned. Um, so one of the most important things when you actually design a product, when you design a movement, and it goes beyond the, um, it goes beyond, way, way beyond the, the, the idea, is that you have to have a holistic approach to how to execute that watch, which means you have an idea, you've got to work out how to manufacture it, you've got to work out how it's going to be assembled, you've got to work out uh, how it's going to survive during uh, through different environmental effects being worn because when you have a product that you stick on your on your wrist it gets beaten up so many people that don't actually are maybe not really aware of it but there's a huge amount of thought that has to take place to be able to work out how to design an original product from scratch and then once you've actually executed it you have to think to the future how is it going to survive and how is it going to be serviced and maintained one year, five years, 10 years, 15 years down the line? So part of it is that you could have the most incredible product in the world, but is a nightmare to assemble, which means that down the road, it's going to have a very short life. So when you design something, you have to have this very long term and holistic view in how to actually execute it. Um, and that's something which I wasn't fully aware of when I first started because I just dived into the into the deep end. But now having seen um, the, the, the thought process, having lived it myself, having designed products, and then having gone to companies like Bosche and Blompa and see how these companies actually do it, I have a lot of respect for for the thought process and the structure behind these companies. So really, uh, if there's if there's a if there's a carrier way, a carrier, um, if there's something to to be to be learned, is is to have a holistic vision in design uh, or in uh, in the manufacture of a product. 
uh, and that goes all the way, almost the least important thing is the, is the idea, all the way through to the execution and a vision of the future. And that's something which you do not, I don't know if you get it in every industry, you should have it, but in, in watchmaking, it's imperative because it is such a complicated process. And it is almost easier to make high-end complication than it is to make a low-end mass-produced product. Because a high-end complication can justify a watchmaker spending days, weeks, or even months actually putting it together in their tiny numbers. Whereas when you have something which is made in, in volumes, it has to be quick to produce, it has to be quick to assemble, it has to be accurate, it has to be resistant to, to whether it's magnetism, shocks, um, all of the outside uh, disturbances, and it has to be financially viable as well. It has to be something which is actually, in relation to its positioning in a market, it has to be realistic. Uh, so it's actually much, much more complicated to make a simple watch than it is to make a complicated watch. Um, that's what so I we can learn about the Swiss kind of design philosophy. Take your time, think everything through, because this process that you're describing is inherently one of the things that can frustrate us about Swiss decision making is that it takes a long time, right? There's a lot of a seeming planning going in. So you're describing a process that seems to lead to very good effects, right? Like when you go through this careful design process for a thing, it does that. But I think we'll agree that outside of this sort of product design philosophy, this isn't necessarily how it works with, with designing things in all of Swiss culture, right? Like there's sometimes where they apply this approach, but the best result isn't always achieved. No, absolutely, absolutely. It's, um, it's something, I think it, it is something which defines the culture. It is something which is why people get frustrated with Switzerland on occasion because of the time involved. And if you do have product which is really accelerated, things which come out in a very short period of time, the sad reality can be that the final consumers who are actually purchasing that product are probably guinea pigs at the same time. Yeah. At least on, on mid to, to low range pieces. It's probably less, uh, it's, it's less uh, problematic when you actually come again to, to, to the higher end watches. The other side of it, the, the second part of the question, in relation to what can Switzerland learn from the outside world, um, is kind of linked. But the one thing which I've I've heard on many many occasions from different collectors, collectors of big brands, it is actually the after sale service that is offered by those companies to the end consumer. And in America, or if I mean, I, I work with um, I work with Apple computers because PC drives me nuts. Um, I work with Squarespace as a, as a web platform. And with both of those uh, American entities, I call them, I contact them, and I get service. If I walk into an American uh, restaurant, you get service. Um, that concept of service, which permeates a lot of American culture, is something which is not present here. As some companies are, okay, but the majority of them that I have experienced with or I've had uh, um, collectors comment on do not have that kind of uh, customer friendly, customer service orientation. Uh, and I think that is something which can define a company immensely. Because even if you have a product which does fail, it's everything everything goes wrong at the moment you know even even coat hangers have faults um everything which is mechanical can have a problem and will have a problem at some moment in time what defines the company is not necessarily just the product but is the service which is behind it and when you work with or when you have service from companies like squarespace or from from apple uh it really it's like day and night it's an extraordinary experience and that is what I would love the Swiss industry to be more like, to, to adopt more why, of. Why don't they value it? Because there's such a high value on, well, there's a high value on comfort there. There's a high value on presentation there. There's a high value on people feeling respected there. Yet you're describing a very common situation that they can't seem to get right. What's wrong? 
Um, I guess one of the things, sorry, I'm just about to charge my phone because it's just about to die. <clears throat> if that's why there's a bit of noise in the background. Um, what is wrong? Possibly, I mean, historically, the, the comparisons of service that we now receive in other industries uh, have accelerated and are far more effective, they're, they're far more professional than they've ever been before. So uh, surrounding industries have actually um, <clears throat> improved uh, radically the services that they actually provide. And the Swiss industry as a, as a whole perhaps hasn't. The other re reality is that after sales service is a necessary evil. It's something which is not always appreciated, at least not over here, not completely. And I'm making sweeping generalizations because there are some companies that do this superlatively. And I haven't had hands-on experience because I'm not a collector. I'm only, I'm only giving feedback from what I've heard from numerous collectors and everybody has, a, has, has an opinion. But you have companies like uh, Rolex who have no option because of the sheer volumes that they produce to be able to have probably one of the most effective and one of the most powerful after sales systems in the world. I've been they, there, it's really cool. It's really they cool. Are, they are, but then you cannot compare normal watch companies to Rolex because Rolex is not a company, it's an institution. Um, if a tool doesn't exist, they design it. And that can be whether it's a screwdriver or a computer, a test piece of testing yeah. equipment. Um, the way that they uh, they organize their their business, it's very slow. Um, but when they once the ship starts moving, you can't stop it. Uh, and the result is like this superlative product in relation to quality and uh, and price. And an after sales service, which is kind of out of this world. But then they're on their own. Uh, I don't think there's any other company in the Swiss industry which is like them. Uh, so they they won't only have that tool made, but they'll have that building constructed, or they will restore that building, and they will they will refurbish it in a way which is completely aligned with their political uh, and technical ethics to be able to maintain the highest possible quality. And why is it that despite the fact that their strategy is so open and obvious? All these other well-funded people haven't been able to replicate it. I would hazard a guess that it it comes basically down to politics. Um, the bigger the company, the bigger the politics. Um, I'm not sure if I'm really the best person to be able to to comment on on something like that. And as I said, I don't have one one you know personal experience i've only got second hand uh, information coming back but i think everybody that i've spoken to it is so needing in so many ways that there must be an awful lot of truth in what the in, in what i'm actually uh, hearing yeah um, yeah listen there, there's a in, in certain companies they work very seamlessly there's an awful lot of commu excellent communication that goes on from the client to the salesperson to the manager through to the to the brand representative all the way through to the brand and then you have other companies that are fairly large and i'm sure this is the same in in every industry where the communication gets lost from the the final consumer who has his issue to through to the person who ultimately makes the decision if you don't have that kind of communication, you're lost. And I've seen it in small companies and I've seen it in big companies. Um, one of the fundamental things I think in any business is that if you, if you own a company or if you manage a company, you need to understand your product and you need to understand your client. If you don't understand your product, it doesn't mean that you have to make it, but you've got to understand it. You've got to understand what it does, who it serves, what its positioning is in the in the world yeah like what it's good at what it's bad at things like sure. that if you don't if you're not familiar with those things then you're kind of guessing and i've met i've met ceos who are there because they are there because they love what they do 
they love the brand, they want to do it to the very best of their ability, and they'll do anything to actually make that happen. And they're the people who I think actually get things done. And then you have another group of people who are there because it's, again, in a sense, it's a job. And they play a very political, safe role. They do their jobs competently, but maybe not superlatively, maybe not to the not not quite as as well as it needs to be to be able to ensure that the, the end consumer people like that the, should never be leaders. That's the problem. You have this culture of promoting middle managers to leaders without them ever actually having demonstrated an ability to lead. Um, you know, recently, okay, I'm going to go off on a slight tangent. Uh, I had dinner yesterday, lunch yesterday down by, by the lake with a dear friend of mine and his, uh, his wife works for a small private bank and she wants to retire. And, uh, the, the two of them, they want to go and buy a small, a small chateau, a small castle in France. Um, which doesn't cost as much as you might think it costs. And I saw pictures of it. It's very, very beautiful. Now, sorry, the moral of the story is the following. She wants to retire and go to live there. And the bank said to her, okay, we understand what you want to, what you want to do. Now tell us what we can do for you so that we can keep you. Uh, do you want to work two days a week, three days a week? Do you want more money? Do, do you want more perks? Do you want w whatever it is? You tell us what you want. And, and, I, I, and I think horrible. So the, the, mor the moral of the story is that finding good people is tough. It's a difficult thing. Um, and maybe sometimes, and I've been guilty of this in my earlier career, I was kind of guilty of this as well. And Max Bousset, uh, guilty of what? Guilty of actually employing uh, people who were good but not great. Max Bousset once said to me, and he actually is the person who told me this, he said, when you have a small company, um, everybody is essential. Therefore, you can't make false economies. You have to have good people and you have to pay good salaries. If you don't, you, you compromise the, the, the whole of the business. And in my earlier career, that's what I did. I thought, okay, I have a limited budget, therefore I have to get people who are associated with what I can actually pay. Instead of trying to find solutions to pay good people good salaries. Um, so at the end of the day, I mean, what this comes back to is that finding people who are competent, intelligent, pragmatic, who can actually, um, who, who can work uh, in, in independently, is, is a tough thing. I mean, there's we are millions of a race, but within a field which is incredibly specialized, uh, wherein many, many external investors um, who are successful in other fields fail in, in this one, watchmaking is complicated. So finding people who are really good at it on multi-dimensions is something which is very difficult to find. Does, I think that probably in a roundabout way answers your question. You're, you're right, and I agree with you, but the problem is this, and this is what angers me. The watch industry is doing nothing to create these people. They're rare to find because it's like they expect them to happen naturally, like some type of phenomenon. People like this can be trained. There's like, as far, okay, there is school in Switzerland to become a watchmaker. Okay, and there might be programs here and there, various schools and things like that uh, to go into the watch industry, but I have never had a conversation with anyone that said, oh, well, in Switzerland, we have the Ivy League of universities to teach you how to thrive in the watch industry. There's like management schools and things like that, but like you have to get this education by accident. The country that needs these people isn't even making these people. I, I, I get it, and I, I, I don't have an answer. I mean, I'm not... But that's a real gap, right? Yeah. I'm not making that up. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't know enough to be able to comment. You, you, in a sense, have a much greater insight into, I'd say, the political and the management aspect of this industry, because you come in contact with it all of the time. You'll be able to see those those CEOs or CEO, COOs or CSOs, whatever, who are actually genuine, 
who are authentic, who are good at their jobs, because you'll meet so many of them, you'll be able to to read them and you'll be able to see straight through the good and the bad. Um, well, you're, you're doing, you want to do some consulting management stuff. Like, why don't you go to brands and say, hey, we'll I'll do a, a two week course with me, Peter, and I will I will teach you what you need to know and tell you what you know that's wrong. Uh, Maybe you can be part of the solution. I mean, you are going into education after all. Listen, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a watchmaker. Listen, I've, I've done everything, okay, in, in my world. I became a very competent uh, commercial guy, sales guy. I learned about how to, to make all the legal deals when it comes to working with retailers and distributors in the same way as all of the IP work, which goes behind developing a brand, whether it's down to a product, a concept, or, or, or a trademark. But at the very end of the day, what I am is a watchmaker. And even though I've, I've done all these different things, I'm not a specialist in those things. So what I do today, and in a field which is incredibly vast, incredibly wide, what I do today is what I know, is what I understand, and it's also what I love. When it comes to the, the politics, the organization, the commercial side, the marketing side, which is constantly changing. This isn't my domain. Um, and it's also not something that drives me. And I'm sure that there are consultants out there who do that better than me. And Peter, I have, you're underselling yourself. You're no, underselling no, 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 yourself. No, no, no. Listen, it's, it's, um, listen there, there are people, I mean, that, that whole aspect of, uh, of the business, I have been in meetings with different companies because I have, I mean, I have worked on multiple levels with people who come in, consultants who come in, who have an incredible, varied, uh, and far more analytical and better structured approach to the business as a whole than I do. And I've sat in meetings where I've, I've agreed with 99% of what they said, but then it's not acted upon. And that's a really frust and they charge a lot. Some of these guys are up to like one to five thousand bucks a day. I mean, it's it's, it's phenomenal. But the find the company at the end of it has to be able to react and change and adapt to to take action upon what is actually fed to them. And it's not always the case. Um, I'm not a politician. Uh, I tend to say what I think, which on occasions will upset people. And on occasions with people who don't have massive egos, they actually appreciate it. Um, because we're living in a business which is really full of, uh, of so much politics and people are trying to protect themselves quite a lot of the time. Not all of the time. Oh, yeah. It, it, it oh, yeah. You, you see that. And again, this is going to be the same in, in, in every industry. I don't have time for it. Uh, I find it I, I'm, I find it exhausting, and what I do, I love. Listen, my friend, you are you, how old are you now? Thirty what? Thirty something? Thirty six. Thirty six years old. Okay, so I'm fourteen years old. Fourteen years, your 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 senior, and one of the things that I've decided to do is do stuff that I enjoy doing, working with people that I want to work with. Uh, I have to make money at the same time, um, which is a necessity of life for, for, for everybody. They love you. But if I can do that by doing what I enjoy, what I'm actually really the best at, and working with people that I want to work with, that's quality of life. There are probably ways of me making a lot more money doing different things with, with people that I'm not that interested in working with, but I can't exchange, I can exchange money for time, but I can't exchange time for money. Other way around, you, you know what I'm saying. Um, I don't get back the time that I use. So with the time that I have, I want to use it in a way which brings me both professionally, financially, and emotionally the best return. And that is why I'm doing The Naked Watchmaker. That's why I developed uh, Stoic, because I see incredible value that goes beyond it goes beyond me. It goes beyond watchmaking, and it goes onto onto the subject and onto a much higher level. So here's where it gets very sweet, right? I agree with you. There's we've been exposed to a certain lifestyle, not necessarily our own lifestyle, but just by virtue of some of the lifestyles of the people that buy luxury watches, we've been exposed to a lot. 
And we know that it's possible to be perfectly content with life and not have to have all those things. Yet at the same time, things like the product that we are that, that connects us uh, require a certain level of um, hustle in order to afford. And so the bittersweet part of it is yes, living simpler can can increase your quality of life. And I totally agree with you as I get older. Yet at the same time, the toys that we're so passionate about, oh, they're so expensive. Is that a question? No, it's just a, it's just an observation. It's just an observation. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because we, we uniquely have been exposed, not maybe perhaps uniquely, but we're not, there's not that many people just by virtue of the business they're in, they are exposed to a certain echelon of existence that is probably best, best in some instances, not even known about, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, 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 I, I, I do, I do. But you see, I'm kind of an, uh, a bit of an anomaly because I've never actually been a collector. Uh, the, only, the only elements, things that I ever collected were actually tools because I, I'm not the guy that buys the car. I'm the guy that makes the car or designs it, a uh, project right. manager. That's and, your satisfaction. And that is, I've never... Or let me never is not true. I've rarely lusted for the products which surround me. Um, my drive has always kind of been the realization of the idea uh, is actually uh, is is the time being spent, is the building, is the making, improving. Um, is is seeing the evolution. It's kind of the life experience which results in the in, in the item. I collected tools because they were the keys. Without the tools, you can't open the door. You can't realize the final the final item, the final product. You can't realize the idea. And that is why. And I, I ended up sell, selling that collection to to uh, to, to help finance my my earlier work. Um, that, that is why I collected, and I collected those things because there was magic in them. There were, there were tools which went back to the, almost to the 18th century. Um, recently, slight tangent, I met a guy called Andre Lachaud, who lives near to, to Bern, Bien, excuse me. And he has spent the last 40 years restoring watch, uh, early watch tools, stuff cool. which was rusty, stuff that was thrown away, he doesn't sell it. It's not, not none of it's for sale. It's a collection. He himself was a guy that he was practical and hands-on, but he developed a company making uh, stainless steel force hips, replacement hips, and he his company ended up making fifteen thousand per month for for many wow. many years, and it still exists today. But forty years ago, I mean, he's a guy. He's, he's about eighty today. Uh, very sharp, very with it, still working, uh, still restoring, uh, still still there 100 percent absolutely amazing guy uh and i am walking around his his personal showroom with over 400 of early uh, lathes and to, uh, topping tools oil cans measuring devices and i ask him about several things and he doesn't even know what they do so I actually started <laughs> photographing them, and I actually I, I recorded uh, I, I made a, a little video with Marc Andre Deschou from Watches uh, Watch the Watches TV dot com. Um, mm -hmm. So some of this stuff is actually going to be aired in a, in, in a few months. But I absolutely love that time. Um, he he was doing it, and he he's done this partly because of the pleasure that he receives from actually saving and restoring these machines and bringing them back to. Honestly, and sometimes some elements are better than they would have ever been in the first place. But he sees it as a preservation of watchmaking, of watchmaking history. And I'm walking around this place and I'm seeing all of these tours and it is fabulous. So it's like an Aladdin's cave uh, of keys. Um, absolutely wonderful. And that's this what I- this isn't open to the public, right? This is like a private no, thing. No, 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 it's, it's a private thing. There is no, it isn't a museum. Um, if anybody does want to see it, he's actually said to me that if I want to bring people there, then because we we've kind of bonded because we have the same 
love, the same vision in, in, in a sense. If anybody does actually want to see this collection, I can effectively take people there if the time actually allows uh, as well. But it's not open to the public. He, he, he has this collection for himself. And the, the value of the collection is really in the volume of pieces which are all together. Because the nature of these kind of tools is that they were, they're priceless, meaning they have zero value and they have the ultimate value. Because nobody really knows what they do. They, they're remnants of a, a, time in, a time in history which has been forgotten, replaced by far more effective modern technologies. Um, so you have to understand it and want to have them. And the market for that kind of thing is absolutely minuscule. But really, what he has is fabulously valuable. Um, and maybe one day it will be uh, respected and appreciated and it will actually have the, 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 the financial value that I see that it has in its perceived value today. Um, okay, so we're, we're coming we're coming close to the end of uh, what we can do in the show. I, I see there's a lot we could talk about, but I want to ask one more question for now, Peter. And that is, what is the watch or the complication that you just never got a chance to make that you really wanted to uh, at Speak Marin? And I'm not saying you'll never do it, but like, what's what's the one that you you really wanted to get out? Um, I'm not going to tell you because I'm actually doing it. Um, Ooh. It, it's actually a, a personal project. It's an idea that I've had for many, many years. Um, and it's something, it, it's not, all, all of watchmaking is about emotion. In fact, every product that we buy on one level or another is about emotion because- How many turbines does it have, Peter? How many turbines? It doesn't have any turbines. <laughs> it doesn't have any, uh, no, no, but it, what, what it is, what it is, it's about time. Uh, it's about the emphasis of the value of time. It's about movement. It's about animation. Um, it's about watchmaking. It's, it's about the, it's about intrinsically what makes watchmaking what it is. Um, and it's something which has never been done before. Some people will get it. Some people won't. But when people see it, they'll all be fascinated by it. And that can be whether it's a collector or whether a novice or somebody who hasn't got a clue what a mechanical watch is. When somebody sees this thing, everybody will be fascinated by it. Uh, and it's something which now, because Stoic is up and running, the Naked Watchmaker is up and running, now I have the time to be able to actually uh, to, to jump into it and to begin to realize it. And it can be executed. And I can execute it today as an individual because of the fantastic technologies like Liga and Mimotech that are around me. Um, which enable me to make highly complex components very easily because of the world that we're presently living in and because of this incredible technology that surrounds us. So that well, I can't is wait about, to see it. It's about a year off. Some people will think it's completely insane, and I don't really care because I'm not doing it for them. Uh, but it's something which will fascinate people when they actually see it. Uh, and like I said, you don't have to have any knowledge to appreciate it. It will... It, it will have a very strong impact when it comes out. Okay, I'm, I'm excited. Peter, tell the audience where, if they want to go right now to, to see more about what you're doing, tell them the website and tell them what else they, they should check out uh, related to your stuff right now. So the, 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 the Naked Watchmaker is actually not me, it's a platform and it is very much all around education. Uh, it's not about training people to become watchmakers because to do that- It you is have safe to, for work. Say that one more time. It is safe for work. It is safe for work. It is safe for work? I don't understand. Oh, okay. So on the internet, there's this thing that's called not safe for work, and that is certain content online that you shouldn't look at at work because it would, like, you know, be potentially adult content. And the word naked <laughs> is in your the website name. So I was trying to um, <laughs> dissipate potential fear that may exist out there that your, your website is uh, possibly uh, softcore porn in nature. No, no, there's no porn available, I'm afraid. I do apologize. <laughs> I would probably be able to make far more money if I was to do that. But no, not, uh, none whatsoever. <laughs> um, no, in, if anything, uh, the Naked Watchmaker is a little bit of an oxymoron. It's, it's not what it appears to be uh, in the sense that it's, I, I am taking the clothes off of watches to show 
what the bodies are, what, you know, dissecting them and showing them to the outside world. And that's really the core content of the Naked Watchmaker platform. So for the Naked Watchmaker, it's one word, the nakedwatchmaker.com. Go there and you, every month I release half a dozen different elements, interviews and deconstructions and sometimes videos, which are often done with uh, Marc-Andre de Choux. Um, there's one newsletter every month. So if people want to keep abreast of what goes on, just stick their name onto the, onto the newsletter, subscribe to it. And then I'm constantly putting material onto the site, small amounts, because each element takes a fair amount of time to actually produce, as you well know. Um, I sure do. Yeah, that's your world, boy. Um, and every month I just send out a newsletter which gives a review, or a summary rather, of the elements that have gone out. And what I also try to do now, especially for the people, is that I have a small team of translators, uh, French, Italian, Japanese, sometimes Chinese, who actually translate the material. And I don't always make that aware, but it kind of filters out into the internet. So people, the barriers of language can be, can, be over, can be overcome. So, and then if you go to the shop, there is a, there's a section where you have books. I've just started to make digital books some of which are the first one, which is actually free, so people can actually download that and get a greater insight into the world of watchmaking, which is the, the name of it. And then below that, you have a, a link to Stoic World, where you have these, uh, these vintage style watches, which I make with uh, Seiko, uh, Seiko instruments in Japan. Um, so, but all can be actually found via thenakedwatchmaker.com.